Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Australian SDS Network's online workshop series. My name's Declan Cush, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Gadigal land and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, so I'm a Vice Chancellor's Research Fellow at the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney Uni, and I'm here really standing on the shoulders of the work of my two colleagues, Courtney Addison and Owen McNamara, uh, who have also helped organise uh, this week's seminar. You guys want to uh, have a little shout out? <laughs> Hi, thanks for that, Declan. And, and Courtney has uh, been doing amazing work behind the scenes as well. Um, so this is the second uh, in the online seminar series. Uh, we also have Adia Benson's uh, keynote, which is already online, as well as last week's panel. Uh, you can view those on, on YouTube. And next week's seminar is entitled Disruption, Opportunity and Rearranging. So for those of you unfamiliar, maybe you, you weren't here last week, uh, just a few points of online etiquette. If you're watching on YouTube, please use the chat to introduce yourself and to ask questions. We'd like to encourage a bit of interactivity on this. This is really a sort of peer um, support activity as much as anything else. And uh, you can also follow along the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag OzSTS2020, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as following the uh, OzSTS grad hashtag, um, sorry, account. Um, so we have a fantastic panel today, and we're really covering the gamut of uh, digital platforms and discussing the idea of digital life in and through STS. We're sort of moving from live journal, which some of you might remember as the defunct social media or journaling website, to lively biomedical data. And our first speaker will be Dr. Emily Vandernagel, who's a lecturer in media and communication at Monash University. And she works on issues at the intersection of identity, internet culture, and social media. Her book, Sex and Social Media, with Katrine Tiedenberg, was published this year through Emerald. And she tweets at EMVDN. And we'll be talking today about her project looking at moribund social media platforms. Professors Celia Roberts and Adrian McKenzie are at the College of Social Sciences at ANU, and they originally hail from Sydney, although they spent some two decades at, at Lancaster University with other STS luminaries such as Lucy Suchman, Vicky Singleton, and Brian Wynne. Adrian has published extensively on issues around data, especially those issues of political economy, that is how programmers, life scientists, and other workers and infrastructure enable databases and other products. Uh, his other keywords include promise, design, value, speculation, subjectivity, and imagination in knowledge economies. Celia is the author of some five books on sex hormones and embodiment, on genetic testing, and reproductive technologies, and on early onset puberty, as well as health, as well as health biosensing and actor network theory. The most recent of these is with Adrian and Maggie Mort, and it's entitled Living Data, Making Sense of Health Biosensing, which I can recommend highly. So we're going to start with uh, Emily's presentation and then move to a joint presentation from uh, Celia and Adrian. So please take it away, Emily. Thank you very much, Declan. Okay, I'll share my screen here. And take this up. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this se seminar slash workshop this morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be talking about some research that I've done on sunsets and memories, which is uh, a latest project of mine, how we bury and mourn dead platforms. Hello, <laughs> you've had a little bit of a welcome to me already. Um, my name's Emily van der Nagel. I'm a lecturer in social media at Monash University. And these are just some of my research interests. I mostly research social media identities, platforms and cultures. 
And then today's, this morning's provocation is if we understand digital life as an archive, what happens when the archive is deleted? I started to think about the way that archives and traces work when I was uh, looking at Sean Lincoln and Brady Rabard's work on digital traces. This, these researchers have, um, have had a, a really long history of going back and asking people to share with them their own Facebook timeline by scrolling back through it and reflecting upon the life narratives contained within that platform. They talk about digital traces as something meaningful for people who create them, share them, look back on them. The idea that Facebook and platforms like it are archives, I think, is a familiar concept when we use these platforms a lot and when we have used them in a sustained way. Um, Facebook, for a lot of us, has become part of the fabric of our everyday lives. And it's been around for over a decade. So having a platform that large, that encompassing, and also that stores so much can mean that it actually becomes a kind of archive. Facebook knows that about itself and it's done, you know, a kind of impressive job with the, with the timeline, with scrolling back and also with the memory function that reminds you of posts past. So when we get used to this kind of persistent platform, you know, when, when we've been on something like Facebook or Twitter for years, if not, you know, over a decade now, we can forget that not all platforms stay active. Some end up getting sunsetted, expiring, or getting switched off. So when I'm talking about sunsets and memories, this is you know, contributing to that broader scholarship on digital memory, remembering, archiving, and nostalgia. I'm also drawing here on Lee Humphrey's work um, when, she, when she discusses memory work, that conscious process of creating media traces to help us remember events and experiences within particular narratives of the self. Um, her, her work here, the idea that we consciously perform ourselves and consciously kind of, you know, materialise ourselves within these platforms leads me to this question. What happens when we have performed memory work on a dead platform? I was also really interested in, in this particular post called Sunset that David Bito, the CEO of Secret, posted um, five, about five years ago now. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating to me this moment when, um, when David Bito was, was closing down his own platform. You know, he was sunsetting what happened uh, with the whole, with Secret, which was anon an anonymous messaging app. Just the way that he put so much feeling into this post really struck me. This has been the hardest decision of my life and one that saddens me deeply, he wrote. Um, you know, when, when he's closing down this platform, he's really suggesting that this, the platform, the company, the people have all been incredibly meaningful to him. So I looked at that as something really productive to explore. I looked at more sunset posts. Um, I, I found 20 social media platforms that have shut down, including Secret. And when I went through all of these different closures, I found the sunset posts or, you know, the, the final declaration that this is a platform shutting down posted by most often the CEOs or sometimes the teams of the platform um, were a specific genre. So sunset posts most often announce the closure, give a reason, and use that kind of emotive language. They call their users a community. They, they express gratitude and regret. Then they most often gesture towards the future for the company or its employees. So here's another example. IMSI, which was positioned as the, the kinder, nicer Reddit. After two years, um, it was time to shut down the site. We've loved getting to know all of you and seeing you build communities and make new friends. Unfortunately, we were not able to find our place in the market. Um, the IMSI community will open to allow everyone to post. This seems like a good place for us to gather, share memories and say our goodbyes. So again, you know, the, this is quite an emotive, quite a personal way of farewelling something um, that obviously the platform owners consider quite meaningful. The sunset posts are designed to spark a sense of loss. They are marking the end of the platform's existence, but they're also aiming to engender trust. 
the people involved in running these platforms often move on to new ventures and they want the users of the sunsetted platform to join them. So in appealing to those invested in the platform, sunset posts ask people to remember them. But do these CEO heartfelt messages really resonate with the people who are using these platforms? What do people actually remember of dead platforms? I asked a few. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of research, I guess, that includes me getting people to do some reminiscing, um, asking people what they remember about specific platforms or indeed how they kind of, you know, approach and appreciate their own internet memories. And skipping through, I mean, a lot of people responded to that survey and there was a lot written about various platforms that people felt nostalgic for or that they loved a lot. Um, so here I'm really just presenting a few key themes that emerged from that survey data when I asked people questions like, you know, what was the first platform that you remember using? What were your earliest memories of the internet? Um, I'm going to bring these questions up in the workshop for the people who are joining me. What they said was, I guess, in some ways, you know, gelling with the, the CEO posts that position their platform as something really um, meaningful and special. But there were also other takes as well. So do people get nostalgia for social media platforms? Sometimes, yes. Somebody has written, I wish I could go back and capture things I wrote. So much of my life since the 90s has been online. There's not much record of me. Another person says, I don't miss the platforms. I miss the youthful energy of my online friends in the 1990s, 2000s and 2010s who are now middle-aged fathers and mothers. So sometimes, you know, reflecting on a platform, really, and I think this is this will come as no surprise, um, really people are reflecting on on relationships, communities, interactions. Uh, do we miss the platforms or do we miss those, those friendships and those people? I think is a, is, is a good question to ask. There was also um, a, a strong theme in that, in that survey data about losing memory work. You know, when platforms die, our data, our, um, you know, our identity work, our digital traces go with it. When Gowala shut down, this was an early uh, locative media platform, I was devastated. I had checked in everywhere. My partner and I took a trip to Europe in 2010-11 and I checked in at everything we did as well as kept a diary in Goala. I later copied out the entries by hand and then waited for the company to allow us to export our sticker and check-in data, but they never did. So all of those moments are now lost forever. Somebody else said, I'm a little sad all my pictures and messages are gone. I'd like to remember what being a teenager was like in some ways, in all its horror and performativity. Um, and then really interestingly for me, I think, was a completely opposite perspective. So, of course, the, a platform CEO is going to talk about their own platform as something really meaningful and special. It's theirs. But sometimes, you know, the users of the platform don't share that sentiment. So the other thing that came through in this survey data when I asked people to tell me about their platform memories was relief that those digital traces are gone. And one participant said, I don't miss either of the social media platforms I use that have shut down. Any content I downloaded is now gone from my offline systems. I am not proud of my pre-university persona and I do not wish to remember a lot of those times. Somebody else who was a big MSN Messenger user said, I didn't try to preserve anything from MSN Messenger. The few chats I kept from the old days are in text files somewhere on an old hard drive and were mostly about breakups. I'm glad they're gone. The ephemeral nature of a chat was half the fun. So there's more to say about dead platforms and digital memories. And again, um, we'll, we'll get to some of those things in the workshop that I'm running just a little bit later this morning. But I think to conclude, the idea of presenting and publishing this research also makes these recollections an archive. These memories are now another trace. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Emily. Uh, please keep those questions coming in on the, the YouTube and the Zoom chat. 
and uh, we will uh, throw to Celia and Adrian, and then uh, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions and, and discussion. So yeah, please, please keep typing them in. Um, we're getting there. Just, <laughs> Sorry. So we're just um, bringing up our slides. Just there. There they are. Yes. So they are there. They've got to be open. La -di -da. There we That's go. They'll be up in a sec. And just present there. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're um, speaking to you from Canberra. So just want to acknowledge that we're on Ngunnawal country and uh, pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and also to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so uh, yeah, so we work at the School of Sociology at ANU and we're going to talk kind of about our own archive of um, STS knowledge and STS work that as Declan said, 20 years, the last 20 years, we've basically been um, in the UK and then two years back here in Australia, having studied originally um, at Sydney Uni. So we chose this picture because we're talking about platforms and of course we always think about platform diving, but we also wanted to um, sort of have a picture of a bad dive because we don't want people to feel like there's some sort of expectation of perfect control. So this is a picture of lack of control. So uh, when we were thinking about STS and methods and archives, we we're thinking about sort of the history of STS as far as we've experienced it and thinking about what's, what is STS about and what does it try and do? What has it done? What has it done? Yeah, yeah what has it done? Um, so thinking a little bit historically, kind of one of the core things about STS uh, for us is its um, work on facts and thinking about particularly scientific facts uh, and how they how they come to be made, um, um, and that that is is a set is a process of work and it's a process of connections between humans and non-human things. Um, so kind of some of the key questions, you know, one of my favourite Donna Haraway questions: What gets to count as X as a fact as nature, for example, and when, and how much does it cost? She asks to produce nature as a fact or as a thing. What are the effects of those kinds of uh, work um, in making things into facts? So we think of some of the classics of A&T, actor network theory. Um, you might think of Bruno Latour's work uh, with Woolgar on laboratory life and the making of a particular hormone as a scientific object. Um, we can think of all the feminist critiques of science, so all that beautiful work uh, Londa Schiebinger, Evelyn Fox Keller, etc., thinking about and criticizing the ways in which um, scientific facts excluded uh, certain kinds of bodies, excluded certain kinds of uh, knowledges. And also, of course, his, his, history and philosophy of science had a huge role to play in thinking about the ways in which the making of facts or what comes to be a fact um, is historically and geographically um, specific. Made in particular times, it's easier to see backwards how that happens sometimes. Um, another branch of STS work that's had huge significance and continues today is the work on controversies, um, partly because um, when something's controversial, you can kind of see facts or knowledge as being made in the moment because we don't know what's going on. So forms of, I mean, a and was doing that, um, but also Scott and SSK, the um, British um, what is this case? Uh, social studies of knowledge, is it? I don't know. <laughs> Forget acronyms. Um, <laughs> so th we were thinking about, for example, um, Declan mentioned Brian Wynn, one of our colleagues who did that very important work on um, the Cumbrian sheep farmers, uh, which was before we'd arrived in Lancaster. So And Chernobyl. And Chernobyl and the whole effect mm -hmm. of the Chernobyl cloud um, on Cumbrian sheep farmers. And that was partly about... Um, thinking about who gets to know scientific things. So the Cumbrian sheep farmers were reframed through um, their STS work as people who could know stuff about the effects of um, radiation fallout on their, on, on their farms. Um, so, and then the third kind of set of knowledges 
that I guess is kind of where we might situate our own work and sort of the work that we're supervising and that it seems is really taking off in Australia in a really exciting way um, is work that's kind of thinking maybe we could classify in terms of concerns, care and crises. So this kind of new set of work um, that's, you know, builds on, that's why I've got a picture of a pyramid, it kind of builds on this earlier work um, in which we think about the ways in which science is involved and science and technology is involved in, in uh, contemporary crises and that we as science studies scholars are part of trying to find ways forward um, and sort of really, you know, getting our hands dirty, being involved in the production of something that could be scientific knowledge, not simply as critique, but also trying to do it in a different way. So one thing, uh, that's a lot of ANTs like that, but we, in this um, recent companion to uh, uh, actor network theory that I was involved in editing, we're talking about near ANT. So thinking about ANT is not something, a sort of set of rules that you have to follow, but a kind of um, way of being in the world as a set of tools to draw on um, that you might be near to, but not exactly using, but very much influencing the way in which you're thinking. So that's a kind of new version of ANT that isn't after ANT, but it's near ANT. Um, personally, I identify with feminist technoscience studies, which for me is about thinking of all the sort of politics of feminism and how that relates to thinking about science and technology, biomedicine, etc. Um, Adrian works a lot in cultural studies and media studies and thinking about that in relation to technoscience and biomedicine. And of course, there's hugely important work emerging on post-colonial and decolonial STS as well. So in all of that, thinking about uh, STS as a form of um, political work. Um, yeah, is that that's enough? Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Um, one, one of the points of that pyramid picture on the previous slide was to, um, to say that you could, could see the history of STS as um, initially beginning with the kind of interest in scientific knowledges and scientific knowledges kind of have an, an epistemological prestige that attracted a kind of lot of scholarly attention in STS. Um, but the second letter in STS is technology, the T in STS is technology. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, what has happened to technology in STS. And obviously that relates to um, the question of uh, platforms. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of ways into this. But again, I thought I might just um, skip through the 40 years or so of work in, in STS um, and try and relate it to platforms a little bit. Um, I guess the, the starting point is um, in that 40 year trajectory on the slide is um, STS attention to things like infrastructures, um, well known work on kind of um, electricity power networks, Hughes's work in the, in the early 80s, late 70s even. Um, work on you know, quite mundane things around technology such as standards. Um, you can find kind of work on uh, the standardization of particular production processes or particular tools um, in SDS. Um, it's often, you know, I found when I first read this, st this stuff um, that, wow, this is incredibly detailed and kind of quite gray. I mean, it's not, it's not the exciting kind of promissory um, the dynamic kind of vision of technology that we, we're really accustomed to getting in, in talk about the discourse of technology in more recent times. It was, it was focused really on technical systems and things like infrastructures quite a lot, um, but trying to understand those as points of intersection between kind of different social interests, um, to see them as, um, as complicated negotiations or translations of different social interests and, and power relations. So that would be the first component of the work. Um, and, you know, it was broadly kind of framed as social construction of technology. There's a second strand of work, and I think this begins in the 80s and early 90s, which began to look at the temporalities of technology much more carefully. And that's this thing about projects and imaginaries. And it was um, 
The two people who I'd mention here would be um, on the notion of socio-technical imaginary Sheila Jasanoff's work. And um, then there's a, a bunch of actor network theory scholars, including John Law and Bruno Latour, um, actually also Donna Haraway in a way, who, who were kind of looking at the temporality of technology in terms of notions such as project to say that, well, much of what's going on in technology is this constant anticipation of what will be constant um, organization and a planning uh, and Lucy Sutton's work who I forgot to mention is totally central here mm -hmm. at least in my mind um, about this idea of you know what will happen this anticipation through plans all kinds of projects um, funding arrangements investments national um, development priorities all kinds of um, collective organizations around technology and uh, they're kind of they they shape our expectations and our experience quite deeply. And this work on socio-technical imaginaries would be, you know, a good analytic framing of that. It's like there's these public performances of what science and technology will do to social order um, or to social life. And, and they're institutionally kind of validated and constantly performed at all different levels, um, from quite local institutional things up to whole global kind of levels. Running out of time slightly. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> we're almost halfway through. Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, so I won't talk too much about that, further about that. And then uh, platformization. I mean, I'll just point to the Venetian um, show pins, these platform shoes down on the bottom. And I, I saw in Emily's slides, Venice appear briefly. So there's a, just a nice <laughs> resonance here about platforms and uh, this problem of kind of lifted out spaces. Platforms is kind of a form of lifting out. Um, which I think um, we're going to try and talk about a little bit further. Also, I mean, Jan Utzen's plans for the Opera House were explicitly conceived as um, this kind of platform architecture in which kind of there's these elevations and access through steps. And I think there's a lot in these figures of lifting out and access through steps um, and, and what you're lifting above, what you're trying to get above. Um, in the case of Venice, it's get above the rising water or the mud or whatever, but um, there's many things that platforms have to do about lifting out that would be interesting to talk about more. Sorry, and I made you forget that bit about embodiment. I think that's just important, isn't it, about affects, habits? Oh, yeah, it's totally resonating with what Emily was talking about, that, um, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about the work that's been done on um, kind of affect, habit, action and experience in this case. There's no time. But yeah, but it does connect. It's central. Yeah. Great. So but then we want to talk a little bit about methods because that's our understanding of what the workshop's about. So this thing about diving in, like, you know, how do you do that? And we wanted to just go over some of the classic kind of um, exhortations that arise out of this history of STS and think about what the problems with those might be or, you know, how they might help you do what you want to do. So the first one, channeling John Law, our friend and colleague from Lancaster, who says, make a mess. And I think this is wonderful advice, and I know lots of students absolutely love this because it's kind of like, oh, thank God, you're allowed to make a mess, and that's actually doing what you're doing. So I think one of the key things about STS, it can, especially it can come across is kind of, you know, it should be very neat, and it's all about measuring stuff and sort of having lines and diagrams and doing technical things, um, mapping networks. But actually, John's work shows us that it doesn't really work like that. That's not how social research works. So we're more like this cat here trying to, mess with some string and that's good so experimenting playing pulling on strings Haraway has that lovely metaphor of the ball of yarn and she says the ball of yarn is this very complex field that we're in and we might just pull on a string you know and sometimes when we pull on a string the ball unravels um, and I think as in a sort of really practical way I would say that involves writing from the beginning and I think you know that's some students worst nightmare to hear that but writing is a way of experimenting and writing is always part of doing STS. It's not, you don't do the research and then write it up, write as you go. Um, and your writing can be messy too. Um, opening a black box, this is a famous kind of STS maxim. Um, the question is uh, how to do it. You know, some, uh, the, the key point here is that um, what's inside technology and what what's outside of it, uh, these are kind of, um, instituted kind of boundaries that we'd want to question in various ways. Um, so how do you open black boxes? I mean, some things are made not to be opened and they have instructions on them not to open them. 
which is, of course, just the provocation to then work out how to open them. Mm. And um, it's a question of methodological kind of invention, what would constitute the means of opening a particular thing in a given situation. Um, but key to that in STS has been um, to not accept distinctions between social and techn technical as kind of given, to always question those distinctions. So to find in the most technical arrangements, um, the traces of social interest or power relations or of, of kind of orderings of social life, to read a technical standard, to examine an algorithm, to look at um, a particular device or gadget from the perspective of what interests are being translated or displaced or negotiated there. And similarly, in the most apparently social thing, the most symbolic um, or elevated or abstract entity, to look for the forms of material practice that allow it to, to actually work as a, as a meaning structure. Yeah, great. And I guess that comment oh, yes. there was just about this sort yes. of this huge scale. Oh, yeah, when you open stuff, there's often like this explosion of stuff comes out, such as scientific literature. If you any of you are immersing yourself in scientific literature, so you know that for a given key term, biodiversity, the web of science will give you 115,000 results, you know, of scientific publications. So what do you do with that? Nightmare. Um, uh, so the classic ANT uh, exhortation is to follow the actors, which you know can be a marvelously uh, sort of helpful thing to do, especially if we think of actors as as in this picture, non-human actors. So the man follows the plow, the plow follows the horses. He's sort of following both a, a technology and some non-human uh, living creatures. Um, but how do we choose which ones to follow? And because it's of huge significance, really, whether you follow a thing, a human or an, an animal. Um, and I guess, as in a ploughing field, you're also following a kind of track. And I, that's one metaphor I kind of like from the earlier a and about how tracks are kind of laid down, traces are laid down. Um, and that that also sort of leaves a trace behind you that then other people might follow. But what's what's outside the trace? Like what's on outside that line? Um, and I think the other question that's kind of arisen in more recent STS is, you know, is following all you're doing? Is following really, it feels a bit passive, not that it's passive, but it feels like you're, you're not really affecting the thing, you're behind it. But actually, you know, the way that he's putting pressure on those arms of the plough probably redirects the horse. He's in communication with the horse through the reins and through the plough. So mm -hmm. it's actually a more complicated relationship than simply following. So I yes. think in choosing your act is important and choosing what following does. Mm. And we, we could talk about soil there too and the resistance, the way in which that, yes. the geology of that terrain is kind of shaping the existence of the furrow. Um, it could be the soil itself as an actor here, the clay is resistant to the plough or whatever. Yeah, exactly. That's nice. Um, yeah, platform edges. So um, here it's um, a question, well, there's edges are interesting places around platforms. And I think in some ways, um, you got to understand um, what Emily was talking about, people kind of being pushed off platforms is to do with edges or platforms ending as a kind of edge in time. Mm. Um, Platform edges are interesting places to try and do work on, partly because they they can be dangerous places. So the mind, the platform edge, the message you hear in on, on British railway stations. Mm. Um, edges also offer points of view that may be quite different to the ones that you get at the centre. The platforms have centralising kind of effects, as we know. We're dominated by a couple of major platforms that centre a lot of activity on the internet, for instance. Um, so. How do you locate the edges of the platforms that you're interested in? What, what constitutes an edge and what's beyond that edge? Also thinking about edges, platforms tend to get us to flatten our thinking, but um, there's a verticality to platforms that's worth thinking about too. That is, there is support structure. There is a kind of, um, there's a verticality and what lies up or down is, is worth thinking about there too. What, what is beneath the platform and what's above it? Beneath there are support systems. And as we've seen in a lot of recent controversies, for instance, the work of moderation done on, on Facebook postings is a, is a huge kind of support system which involves all kinds of dangers and trauma and difficulty for the workers doing the, the content moderation. So edges are, are definitely worth looking at. Mm, great. Um, so this is kind of going back to what I was saying on the first slide that I think increasingly 
um, I think SDS has always been political, but it was often criticised for not being political because I think it was trying to resist a, a pre another sociological idea of what it means to be political, that you talk about structures of inequality or you talk about patriarchy or something. Um, so there was a sort of part of its history that it was saying we don't want to think through those categories. But nonetheless, um, SDS is politics. And this thing about knowing is intervening, I think is, I find that a very helpful kind of maxim for myself. Um, of course, there's risks of ambulance chasing, um, you know, and that's partly... What Not, does that mean? Um, <laughs> well, I think like following the latest controversy or following the latest crisis, um, you know, both Adrian and I worked in um, the Centre for Economic and Social Aspects of Genomics at Lancaster, and that was a whole moment in Britain when genomic science was on the rise. And suddenly everyone was doing social science on genomics because there was money there. And sometimes you can't, <laughs> it's not your fault if you have to do ambulance chasing because that's where the money is. But I guess we're making a bit of a plea for following things that aren't sexy or exciting or cool some of the time and thinking about other forms of uh, te technical digital platforms that are really important. Um, and one thing that I think is really important in this and that we've learned a lot about at Lancaster is about thinking about relationships to so-called experts, um, publics and stakeholders and sort of putting ourselves in learning how to put ourselves in the mix in knowledge production. So thinking about, for example, uh, Adrian's doing some work with ecologists here in Canberra. Um, I'm doing some work on, we're both working on sort of climate crisis at the moment in some ways. I'm doing some work with clinicians here about women who are pregnant during the bushfires in Canberra and how we might think about what it means to be pregnant um, during a time of a climate crisis. And so the, medic, the medics are sort of measuring bodies and things, and we're gonna actually talk to people about what they did and how they biosensed the air quality, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what's changed over that 40 years is yes, people are becoming seen as experts and we're of interest now to these other forms of experts, but also that we're trying to change who gets to count as an expert. Um, so I've done a lot of work, work on patients as experts in particular disease areas. Um, I do a lot of work on people in digital spaces who are experts, etc. So this idea of co-production of knowledge is super important and being part of that. And this is our last slide. So um, I guess this is how I would exhort you to uh, make connections. And I think part of that is SDS as an interdisciplinary field. And we need, it's very complex and we're dealing with a vast array, range of knowledges. So being together and talking with each other like we are now, being part of AusSTS, but being part of uh, international scholarly networks is super important in doing this work well. So um, try and get involved. Thank you. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that. There's a huge amount there to uh, to, to chew on and some absolutely fantastic metaphors for the work of STS. Um, we've had a, uh, a question come through from the YouTube channel that might be a, a good uh, point of discussion around platforms and monetization. It comes from uh, Davina Sawate, um, who sort of talks about the way that uh, people are on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and is pondering you know, what would happen for, for her sort of personal digital social archive if those platforms disappeared one day, but is also asking the extent to which monetization might be actually lending those platforms some longevity. So uh, I thought I'd throw that back to, uh, to Emily and to uh, Adrian and Celia on the extent to which uh, platforms in in not, not just the ones that we're familiar with on, on Facebook and, uh, and the like. Uh, how, does the, how do the dynamics of monetization figure, uh, do you think? Um, thank you for the question, Davina. It's a, it's, I can see the comment here that says that, um, that Davina personally hasn't thought about the impact of a platform shutting down because she hasn't experienced it. So, so yeah, like, like we all, I guess, have our own entry points and exit points into um, platform culture. And I kind of do mean social media platform culture there. But of course, as Adrian and Celia have, have noted, platforms um, encompass a lot more than that. Do 
does money make platforms stick around? Um, yes and no. It's a really great question. You know, does monetizing a platform mean like, does that lead to its longevity? Sometimes, sure. I mean, I think we can understand Facebook as being, you know, a very economically successful platform. It makes a lot of money. Um, and, and certainly that's a factor in it sticking around. Some of the smaller platforms that I looked at for the Sunsets and Memories project included, um, you know, platforms that were so successful on their own and, and actually did make a lot of money that they were absorbed into a bigger platform. So, for example, Goala, which was a really early um, kind of locative media platform where people would, you know, use the GPS coordinates and use the, um, the, the GPS on their phone to go and, like, check into places. Um, you might be familiar with that kind of language from something like Foursquare. Uh, but, but Goala ended up being so successful and so good at what it did that it was absorbed into Facebook, you know, Facebook bought it. So sometimes... Um, monetizing and, and economic success does lead to longevity. Sometimes it leads to uh, some unintended consequences like being absorbed or bought by a bigger company, for example. But certainly that monetizing is um, a really important part of what, what makes a platform live and die and grow. Um. Yeah, I, I could just quickly say something about some work I've just been doing with Catherine Wolby, another colleague here at ANU. We've been looking at um, egg freezing and menstrual tracking, and that's and looking at the monetization of that, um, encouraging all women uh, to think of themselves as you know the future infertile, and to think about monitoring and then possibly by interventions in order to protect their fertility into the future and there's you know it's hugely interesting um, new work coming out about the whole ways in which uh, companies are investing in that and women are, are, are being encouraged to see their own fertility as something they should invest in, in the way that you know you should save money for a mortgage you should also preserve your fertility and of course they're you know totally dependent on biomedical platforms that were developed for IVF for treating infertility, which now need to sort of create, as Catherine and I are arguing, there's a desire to create more and more potential customers. So all women get reproduced or not all, almost all. We're trying to talk about who doesn't. There's still people whose fertility is seen as a problem, but people with enough means to pay uh, are seen as, as are being produced as people who should engage in these platforms, which could be biosensing, but then also biomedical interventions. So I think that's a, a different but related um, case of that. Fantastic. And just, just in, a, in our final minute, I was hoping to draw you out quickly on any tips that you have for Odds STS as a, as a network. Because uh, you you encourage us to to form networks and to and to and to build up. So from your time in Lancaster, especially, um, what what advice would you have towards SDS? I'd say make yourself into a platform. <laughs> Get a, make sure you're on every platform. <laughs> no, it's really hard, isn't it? Because I feel I mean this is sort of the grief of COVID, isn't it? Because I feel like. The thing that worked, Lancaster is a small town, but people came there a lot, and especially we had a huge, like the mobility of PhD students was so fantastic, and people could just move around and come as visiting scholars. And I thought, came to Australia, think, oh, this is great, we can do this, but that's yeah. tough at the moment. But I, you know, let's hope that will change that we can come back to moving around. But I think it's really important to to visit each other and mm -hmm. to talk with each other. Can I say one other thing? Just um, um, there's a you know there's various kind of regional STS networks around the world. There's um, the Nordic STS network, and obviously there's STS Oz STS. And I mean, I think what made some of uh, Lancaster work was it's quite provincial approach to things. Like this, John Law has this expression, provincializing STS, which sounds like a really negative thing. You're going to become parochial. But actually, um, not trying to be global, and actually trying to really focus on the specificities of kind of what is the Australian situation with its adjacencies and connections to other places, um, would be really valuable, and it would be something that kind of actually travels really well um, to other places, rather than us becoming part of the general global cosmopolitan 
STS thing, which which we could also want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand the appeal of that, um, but I actually think mm, we'll just be swamped. Actually, being really provincial could be a, a good strategy. Fantastic. So bringing perhaps part of the you know specific geology and culture and ecology of, of Australia into into STS, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thanks very much to uh, to all three of you for your wonderful provocations there. And uh, for those of you staying on for the workshop, please uh, log on. Otherwise, we'll see uh, everyone on the live stream next week uh, for the final seminar in the series. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, Declan.